glad you all well good morning usually when we gain an hour we're supposed to all be rested and energized do you guys feel that way i was i was just as late this morning as i always am well let's open a word of prayer and we'll get started father we're grateful for um your word we're grateful for your truth We're grateful for the lives of your people, and you seek today in your church to minister to your people through your word, and no human teacher has the ability to do this, but only the Spirit can take the deep things of God and make them known to us. So I pray, Father, that today, as we seek to look into your word, as we celebrate communion, as uh, we have a moment to reflect upon Uh, two of our new missionaries, as we have the fellowship lunch that follows, administrative meetings, everything that's going on at this church. I do specifically pray that we would not just be doing religious activity, but you would be taking the things that we're doing here as we seek to obey you and ministering to the deepest needs of the soul. We pray that you'll encourage us where we need to be encouraged, comfort us where we need to be comforted, and also, Lord, correct it in areas we need to be corrected. And we just trust you today for this great work. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, if you could um, take your Bibles and open them to Matthew's Gospel. chapter 24, verse 31. And as you know, we're continuing, well, we've actually completed our study on the rapture. And at that point, I opened it up for people to submit questions. Um, So there are two questions here on our mailbag for today, and I don't even think we'll get to the second one. The first one is such a big deal. The first question is, will the rapture occur on a Jewish or Hebrew feast day? And then the second question is Isaiah 26, verses 19 and 20, speaking of the rapture. So let's talk about this one first. This is a big deal in the sense that there are many people out there who basically believe that the rapture has to happen on a Jewish feast day. Have you guys heard this before? Okay. So what do they mean by a Jewish feast day? Well, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, there are seven feasts on the Hebrew calendar that God told the nation of Israel to celebrate. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Those are the four spring feasts. And then later on the calendar comes trumpets, atonement, and booths, or sometimes booths is called tabernacles. So what people are trying to do is they're trying to connect the rapture with trumpets, one of the fall feasts. And I notice that when that feast time period comes and goes, they say, okay, no, it's atonement. So the bottom line is they're trying to connect the rapture to a Hebrew feast day. And they feel that they're justified in doing it because Matthew 24, verse 31 says of Jesus, he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's got to be the rapture, right? There can't be more than one trumpet in the Bible. So they, they'd use the what I call the ram, jam, and cram method of interpretation. Every trumpet is the same trumpet. So they don't have a trumpet for the church age and a trumpet for Israel. So it says, and he will send his angels with a great great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, who they think is the church, from the four winds from one end of the heaven uh, to the other. And so ever since I've come of age as a Christian, I've heard people teaching this that the rapture has to take place on the Feast of Trumpets, one of Israel's um, fall feasts. In fact, I knew a fellow who would put out like extra milk for his cat. 
when the calendar rolled around for Feast of Trumpets, because he was sure the rapture was going to occur on Feast of Trumpets, and I'm thinking to myself, well, that's a lot of milk you better put out there. I mean, did you put out seven years of milk? So I don't even know if putting out extra milk is that helpful. Now, before I get into this, let me just give you the answer. Does the rapture have to take place on the Feast of Trumpets? Well, it could. I mean, there's nothing that says it can't. Uh, It's possible. But that's really not the issue. What people are saying is it has to. Okay? And I'm saying this, that the rapture can happen at any moment. It is a calendarless event. That's the way God designed it. No one knows exactly what day or month or year it's going to transpire. So if it happens on the Feast of Trumpets, that would be interesting. But it doesn't have to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. And so this is an issue that involves an understanding. And this is where people are confused. Because if they're confused on this, they're confused on four other things. So here are the four sub-issues that you have to understand to be able to answer the question the way I just answered it, that the rapture doesn't necessarily have to happen on a Hebrew feast day. The first is the whole subject of eminency and what that means. That's issue number one. The second issue is, is it ever justified to put the church of Jesus Christ under the law of Moses? Because that's where Leviticus 23, which gives us these four feasts, seven feasts, excuse me, is found. It's found in the book of Leviticus, where God gave specific instructions to Israel at Mount Sinai. Leviticus is part of the Sinai revelation to Israel. So if you're saying that the that the rapture which concerns the church has to happen on a Jewish feast day, it's a subtle way of putting the church under the Jewish law. And is that ever justified? That would be issue number 2. The third issue is it misunderstands the nature of the church. The church is not a nation. So it doesn't have a calendar system the way Israel does. And so people that want the rapture or say the rapture happens, it has to happen on a Jewish feast day, misunderstand the calendarless nature of the church. And then the fourth issue is, okay, smarty pants, um, if what you have said is true and the rapture doesn't have to happen on a feast day, then why did God start the church on the day of Pentecost? So the day of Pentecost is a feast day. The church started in Acts 2, and people say, well, if it started on a feast day, it's got to end on a feast day. So if it started on the day of Pentecost, it's got to end at the Feast of Trumpets. So with that being said, you can see why this is not an issue that you can just answer what without the why. And so rather than just shout out an answer, I want to explain to you why I answered the question the way I did. So let's talk first of all about the eminency of the rapture. Now we've covered this um, in prior lessons. But what we mean by eminence is the rapture is a signless event. In other words, there is no prophetic sign that has to transpire before the rapture can occur. That's what we mean by eminency. The second advent at the end of the 70th week of Daniel is not an eminent event. The second advent could not take place today. Why? Because the Bible gives us signs that are mandatory before the second advent can occur. Before the second advent can occur, there has to be seven years of tribulation first. So can the second advent occur today? No, it cannot. Can the rapture occur today? Yes, it can. In fact, the rapture could occur before this Sunday school lesson is over. And some of you are praying, probably praying for that to happen. 
And I, I, you know, I, rather than reteach everything that we've taught on this, you can go back into the archives and view it and listen to it. But those are the verses that we used. The second bullet per, a point down, where as you go through rapture passages, it always portrays the rapture without any sign occurring before it. So just to kind of refresh, refresh your memory, uh, you might recall the book of James, chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, <clears throat> which says, You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. That one hurts, so doesn't it? So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So it never says uh, Jesus is coming, but before he comes back in the rapture, look for these three things first. It never portrays the rapture that way. I like to use that example of those Velcro plastic balls that you used to be able to throw up on the ceiling and they would stick there. And you knew they were going to come down at some point, but you just didn't know when. That is sort of how the rapture doctrine is designed intentionally by the Holy Spirit. It could happen at any moment. It's overhanging us. Uh, we're in a state of expectation for it, although we don't know if today is the day. But today could be the day. When Jesus first announced the doctrine of the rapture, he never gave a bunch of signs that have to precede it. What he said was in John 14, verse 3, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. He never says, okay, um, I'm going to come back, but before that happens, watch out for Bill Gates. You know, by the way, is, is Bill Gates mentioned in the Bible? Yes, Bill Gates is mentioned in the Bible because Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. <laughs> So he didn't say, watch out for Bill Gates, watch out for the vaccination, watch out for the World Economic Forum. All those things have to happen, then the rapture can come. He just says, I'm coming again. So it's signless. Uh, over in the book of Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul says, for our citizenship is in the United States of America. Whoops, doesn't say that. For our citizenship ultimately is in what? Heaven, from which also we eagerly await for the recovery of the stock market. Whoops, doesn't even say that. For which also we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're to be always waiting for Jesus because he can come back any second. Paul himself believed this truth so strongly that I think he actually thought Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. At least that was his expectation. Because when Paul describes the rapture, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And then he says, We. So he expected that he was going to be in the group. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. Now, Paul is in the group. It's just because he died before the rapture, he's in the group that's coming back. He's not in the group that's being caught up. But he lived his life on the earth as if he could be in that group that's caught up. This is what we mean by eminency. So when you think about this for a minute, the whole idea that the rapture has to happen on a Hebrew feast day, would, would that not deny eminency? Here's sort of a circle that shows you Israel's feasts. <clears throat> You've got the uh, four spring feasts, three fall feasts. You see trumpets there towards the bottom of the Jewish calendar. And if you're telling me that the rapture, not could, but has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, that means it can't happen any other time of the year, right? And if it can't happen any t other time of the year, that denies eminency, where the Lord tells us it could happen at any moment, any time. So be ready all the time. That's why the Lord set up this doctrine the way that he has. He wants us ready 
<clears throat> all of the time. And if it can't happen till trumpets, I can just sort of relax and slack off and then get serious about the Lord, you know, when the calendar moves that direction. So the first thing to understand about this whole idea that the rapture has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets is the people that teach that um, are teaching confusion concerning the doctrine of eminency. And that, to me, is not even the biggest problem. Uh, that, to me, is the smallest problem with what they're saying. A far bigger problem is they're taking the church, second bullet point here, and putting it under the law of Moses. Now, why is that? Because when the Lord released Israel from 400 years of bondage and took them to Sinai, he gave them the Mosaic law, which would include the book of Exodus, and the book of Leviticus was given at that same time, where we have the feast days in Leviticus 23. So Leviticus is part of the Mosaic law given to the church. There is no geographical movement in the book of Leviticus. It's all being received by Israel at the same time at Mount Sinai, meaning that it's part of the Mosaic law, part of the Sinai uh, revelation. So Leviticus 23 is part of the Mosaic law. Now, the rapture concerns the church. If you're saying the rapture has to happen on a Hebrew feast day, you just took the church and you put it under Leviticus 23. And that's a problem. Because when you look at Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, God is very clear that the Mosaic law was only for Israel. It was never given to any other people. He says in Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, he declares his words to who? To Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances, that's the Mosaic law, to Israel. And then it says, he has not dealt thus with any nation. As for his ordinances, they have not known them, praise the Lord. The Mosaic law is for Israel. The church is not Israel. Well, how do we know the church is not Israel? We know the church is not Israel because Paul, in Ephesians 2, verse 15, when he describes the new body that we are all part of, he calls it there a new man. New means new. We're not an offshoot of Israel, although the church all started with Jewish people. Um, we're a completely separate and completely independent work of God. Ephesians 2 verse 15 says, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments and ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two, now that's believing Gentiles and believing Jews, both groups who have trusted in Yeshua or Jesus as the Messiah. He has taken those groups and made the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And as you go through the Bible, what you'll discover is the church and Israel are always distinguished. There is not a single passage contextually understood that makes the church into Israel. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32, Paul says, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. See how he's got them all separate? Just as Jews and Greeks are independent and separate, so are Israel in the church. Now, I want to be very careful. Of course, we're not saying that a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob can't believe in the Messiah and become incorporated into the body of Christ. <clears throat> and as they do that, they don't lose their Jewishness. They're still Jewish. Just like a man that gets saved is still a man. And a female that gets saved is still a woman. And look at that. I can't even use that analogy anymore this day and age. 
But the truth of the matter is you're part of the church. You're part of this new man. And with a new man comes new authority. And so if the Lord wanted to put us under the Mosaic law, there would have been something that equates the church with Israel. The church is never used as a synonym for Israel, and Israel is never used as a synonym for the church. In fact, the name Israel is used 73 times in the New Testament. And guess what it means every single time? It means Israel. Israel means Israel. The church means the church. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, if you don't believe this, at least look at the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts was written before the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And in the book of Acts, the church, which is birthed on Pentecost, and the nation of Israel are always kept separate. God never, ever, Dr. Luke in the book of Acts never conflates the two. In the book of Acts, Arnold Fruchtenbaum says, both Israel and the church exist simultaneously. The term Israel is used 20 times in the book of Acts, and the term church, which is the Greek word ekklesia, is used 19 times, yet the two groups are always kept separate and distinct. The church is the church, Israel is Israel. So therefore, to argue that the conclusion of the church has to happen on a Jewish feast day is to take the church and put it under Israel's legal system when Israel's legal system was only intended for Israel. That's a far bigger issue than the eminency issue, is putting the church under the Mosaic law. Now, when you talk like this, I'll, I'll prepare you for the response you're going to get. There's a, little, there's a little word they throw at you, and they say, you're antinomian. Can you guys say that with me real quickly? Here we go. Antinomian. All right. Anti is against. Namas means the law. You're against the law. Uh you don't want to respect the law of Moses, then you must be one of these types of Christians that believes anything goes, you know, loose living, licentiousness, I've got my fire insurance paid up, you know, I'm on my way to heaven, live however you want. The, the, the charge of antinomianism was leveled against Paul himself because Paul taught exactly like you're hearing me teach right now, the same concept. In fact, Paul wrote entire books of the New Testament. You could jot down the book of Galatians as an example. Telling the new church that they are not under the Mosaic law for purposes of justification nor sanctification. And the Pharisees in Israel, when they heard that, they didn't like that at all because they were trying to make the church just kind of a denomination or something within Israel. They wanted to put the church under the Mosaic law. <clears throat> and so they charged Paul with antinomianism. That's why Paul in his writings goes out of the way to explain that he is not in favor of loose and carnal living. It's just the walk of the spirit rather than the Mosaic law is what brings the Christian to maturity. So how do you respond to this idea that you are suddenly antinomian? Well, notice just for a minute, Romans chapter 6. And look at verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. That is the response to anybody who says the church has to go back under the Mosaic law. We don't go back under the Mosaic law because we are not under law, but we are under grace. Now, is it neat to study the Mosaic law? Of course, 
Is it neat to go to Jewish or Hebrew oriented seminars where they give you the full meaning of the seven feasts? And actually there's nine feasts because Purim was added to the calendar later and Hanukkah was added to the calendar later. Is it, is it, is it appropriate to go to seminars where you, where you learn the Jewish roots of Christianity? Of course that's appropriate. Is it okay even if you want to celebrate those feasts? Well, if the Lord has led you to do that, that's fine. The problem is when you make it obligatory, now we have a problem. The moment it becomes something that's not just educational, but something you have to do to reach full stature in Christ is the moment you're committing the Galatian heresy which was putting the church under the law for purposes of justification and sanctification. So the church of Jesus Christ, by its very design, is not under the law of Moses, including the seven feasts or nine feasts of Israel. Well, you must be antinomian then. You must be against the law. Absolutely wrong. Because if you look at Romans 6, verse 2, same chapter. Actually, look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Why would Paul even entertain this question? Because he got thrown, what got thrown at him was the label of antinomianism. You're in favor of licentiousness. What does he say? May it never be. Uh, that's the Greek translation of the Greek word meganoita which is the strongest negative you can have in the Greek language. It's like saying never, never, never with 15 exclamation points after it. Absolutely not. Spanish translation would probably say no way, Jose. <laughs> but no, no, I am not antinomian. No, I am not in favor of loose living. What does he say there in verse 10? How shall we who died to sin, live under it any longer. And he goes on and he describes here what is called the law of Christ. He is under the law of Christ, the royal law, which is not the law of Moses. So the church is under a legal system, but it's the New Testament legal system, and it's not the Mosaic law, sometimes called the law of, of Christ. Uh, Romans 8 verse 2, if you look at that for a minute, calls it the law of the Spirit. Look at what he says in chapter 8 verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of the law of death. In other words, if you want to be set free from a life of sin, you don't go back to the law of Moses. You go to the law of Christ. If you'll look just for a minute at Galatians 6 and verse 2. A few books there to the right. It calls this legal system the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfill the law of what? The law of Christ. That's the response to the charge of antinomianism. Because when you say we're not under the law of Moses, people will say you're antinomian, and that isn't true at all. We believe in a legal system. It's just a legal system developed from the epistles, New Testament revelation primarily. And in that new legal system... It looks similar to the law of Moses at points, but it's not the law of Moses. Um, I'm from California, sorry to admit that. And let's say I commit a crime in Texas. Let's say I commit murder in Texas. They have laws in the books in California against murder. Now they don't enforce them all that well, but, but that's another issue. If I commit a crime in Texas, I'm going to be tried in a Texas court. I'm not going to be tried in a California court because the moment I change my residence from California to Texas is the moment I came under a new system. 
the new system that we are under has no mandatory calendar and it has no mandatory feast days. And in fact, the law of Moses is set up in such a way that the moment you put one little finger under the law of Moses, you're under what? You're under the whole thing. The law of Moses is not a take it or leave it proposition. So you know the passage in the book of James chapter 2, he who stumbles over the law, in this case the law of Moses, at one point is what? Guilty of all of it. So you want to tell people that you have to celebrate the Jewish feast days and the rapture of the church is going to happen on a Jewish feast day because that's what it says in Leviticus 23. If you do that, you just put the whole church under the Mosaic law, not part of it, but all of it. Which means you should have brought with you an unblemished animal to sacrifice this morning. I noticed no one did that. By the way, why did you show up on Sunday? You should have showed up on Saturday. And by the way, what are you doing here? You should be in the Middle East worshiping at the temple. Oh, that's hard. We don't have a temple right now. And you ought to be stoning to death Sabbath breakers. Because in Numbers 15, there was a man that was picking up sticks on the Sabbath, and God said to Moses, throw rocks at him till he's dead. So you can't play this little game of, oh, we're under the feasts, the rapture is during a feast day, without putting the church under the whole law of Moses. The church is a new man, it is not Israel, and it is not under the law of Moses, but it is under the law of Christ, although the law of Christ at certain points looks like the law of Moses. Murder is wrong in both systems. But the system is different. Just like California and Texas, they look alike in their terms of their legal system, but those are two totally independent legal systems. So the way to reach full stature in Christ in the New Testament age is not to demand that people follow the law of Moses in an obligatory sense, but it is to teach them the walk of the Spirit, God empowering us, as we live out New Testament epistolary revelation. Now, Reformed theology has almost no answer for this because they believe that we are the new Israel. The church is the new Israel. The church is under the law. And then you ask them, well, have you stoned to death recently Sabbath breakers? And their response is, oh, what you don't understand is the law of Moses is divided into three. There's the moral provisions like the Ten Commandments, there's the ceremonial provisions um, like the sacrifices. And then there's the punitive governmental regulations like stoning to death Sabbath breakers. And they will tell you that we are not under the ceremonial part. We are not under the penal governmental part, but we are under the moral part. That is the classic answer from Reformed theology. The problem is, can someone show me anywhere in the Bible where the law of Moses breaks itself up into those three categories? It doesn't. As you read through the law of Moses, it doesn't say, okay, here comes the moral stuff. Are you done with that? Okay, here comes the ceremonial stuff. Are you done with that? Okay, here comes the punitive stuff. That, that whole division is made up. The Bible doesn't teach such a division. And what the Bible teaches is if you put your little tiny finger under the law of Moses, you're under the whole thing. You follow? So if you want to say, I'm under the moral part of it, I'm under the feasts aspect of it, you can't say I'm not under the rest of it because of the way the law of Moses is set up. So a second major problem with this idea that the rapture has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets is you just took the Church of Jesus Christ and you put it under the Mosaic Law because the Feast of Trumpets is part of the Sinai revelation to the nation of Israel 
and only the nation of Israel was given that revelation. It wasn't given to anybody else. First problem with this idea, it denies imminency. Second problem with this idea is it places the church under the Mosaic law. Third problem with it is it misunderstands the nature of the church. Uh, People that believe this don't understand ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. We've developed in this church uh, a series that you can find in our archives on ecclesiology. And people that are always saying the rapture, which concerns the church, has to happen on a feast day, don't understand ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, Because the church is not a nation. Israel, looking at the very bottom of the screen, was a nation. Israel was a country. And because Israel was and is a country, she functioned just like a country. She had to have an army. She had to have borders. She had to have a capital city. She had to have a taxation system, which is why the doctrine of tithing was not optional under the Mosaic Law. In fact, if you were living under the Mosaic Law, you didn't just tithe 10%, you had to give 23 and one third percent of your income to the Lord, just like on April 15th, it's not optional that you pay your taxes. They were mandatory. Why? Because there were two tithes that happened annually, and then there was a third tithe that happened every uh, third year. So 23 and a third percent total, non-optional. Now you look at the principles of grace giving as developed in the law of Christ, the law of the spirit, the epistolary literature, and you will find absolutely no number given concerning what you should give to the Lord. What are developed are adverbs, which modify verbs. So under the law of Christ, you give generously. You give freely. You give joyfully. You give secretly. You don't give grudgingly. 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, and it never says there, by the way, you better give 10%. The 10% figure is now irrelevant to you because you're under a completely different system. What's relevant to you is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which has different principles of giving because the church is not a nation. The way the nation of Israel uh, was a was a nation. So Israel had tribes. She had a divided kingdom eventually, the ten northern tribes, the two southern tribes. Headquarters of the south was Jerusalem. Uh, the headquarters of the north was a place called uh, Samaria. And what you'll discover is the church has absolutely nothing like this. By the way, because Israel was a nation, she had a calendar. There's a specific calendar given by God to Israel over certain months and the feast she had to celebrate on given months. There is no such New Testament revelation for the church. In fact, Paul says in Romans 10 and verse 19 that the church is not a nation. What does he say here in Romans 10 verse 19? He says to Israel, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. Who do you think that might be? That's us. God has taken up with another woman, in essence. We are the bride of Christ. God was, or Israel was, to God, the wife of Jehovah. And so now, as God is pouring out his grace on the predominantly Gentile church, Israel is supposed to be getting jealous as she sees it happen. And she's desiring her place of privilege back. 
And so God, as God is pouring out his grace on the church, he's planting the seeds of envy in the heart of the unbelieving nation of Israel, where that seed is going to be brought to fruition in the events of the tribulation period where a believing remnant in the nation, nationally, I'm speaking of, will be converted. So because the church is not a nation, we don't have kings. Uh, We don't have judges within the church the way Israel did. We don't have borders. We don't have a capital city. We don't have geography. Now, if you want to know who's completely messed up on this, look at the Roman Catholic Church, where they believe that they are the new Israel. And the Pope, or the Pontiff, is the vicar of Christ on the earth. That's replacement theology. So that's why the Roman Catholic Church is always trying to extend its influence into political affairs like the United Nations. That's why there's an actual Vatican City, because they look at it as just like the capital city of Jerusalem. And it all come, it, 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 this whole Roman Catholic system, it really comes from Augustine, the fourth century. The Catholic's Catholic, the quintessential Catholic as he is called. And he is the one who formalized the doctrine of amillennialism, which is a fancy way of saying replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. And so that's why you see the Roman Catholic system always looking back to the Mosaic law for its cues on how it should function. Right, right down to this idea that you have to confess your sins to a priest to get to God. Why would they think that? Well, that's what the Levites were involved in. So there's no authority for the Roman Catholic system under the law of Christ, so they have to go back and selectively dip back into the law of Moses. And that's a theological error, because if you're under any of the law law of Moses, you're automatically under what? The whole thing. And by the way, the law of Moses was not meant for the church anyway. It wasn't meant for any nation at all other than the nation of Israel. So one of the things, Galatians 3 verse 28 of the church says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. This is talking about our position. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. The church does not consist of a particular ethnic group or a particular nationality. It consists of believers for the last 2,000 years scattered all over the world that have trusted in the Messiah that the nation, the nation in terms of its leadership rejected. The moment you trust in that Messiah for your salvation, you have become baptized in the Spirit where the Spirit takes you through a supernatural work and identifies you to this new man called the church, which is never called Israel. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And this new man called the church has no connection to the Mosaic law. What it has a connection to is a new legal system called the law of Christ or the law of the Spirit. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about the nature of the church is it had no... uh, Well, Israel had, but the church didn't. Israel had time indicators all the time. Uh, The Latin term for this is aquo adquem statements. So as you study God's dealings with the nation of Israel, you'll find him mentioning numbers. So he says you're going to sojourn in Egypt for how long? 400 years. And then I'm going to bring you out with great possessions. Genesis 15, verse 16. That's a a quo, ad quam, quam statement. Then he says, you're going to go into Babylonian captivity for how many years? 70. That's another a quo, ad quam statement. And then he gave through the angel Gabriel to Daniel a clock 
which has exactly 490 years on the clock. Now, we believe 483 of those years have elapsed. Seven years are le- yet remaining, but Israel has, an, it has, an, has a stopwatch where God clicked the start button, the pause button. The day in history will come where he'll re-click the restart button, and then he'll click the stop button. Those are ah, quo, ad quem statements. Start, stop, 70 years, 400 years, 490 years. Um, what is very interesting, as you study New Testament revelation, there are no timing passages. God never says to the church, 400 years, 490 years, 70 years, etc. In fact, when you go into the Old Testament, you'll find the prophet Ezekiel lying on one side, 390 days. And if I remember right, the other side was, what, 30 days or 40 days, something like that. And those represented years of the northern kingdom's rebellion and the southern king's rebellion. Rebellion. That's a number. That's a a quo, ad quem statement. Judgment is going to start at this time and it's going to end at that time. Now, you go into New Testament Revelation and you see nothing like that. You don't see 400 years, you don't see 70 years, you don't even see a calendar. Because the church itself is calendarless. Um, here is a calendar that you find for Israel. I mean, if you find it for the church, I'm interested because it's not there. The very nature of the church is without a calendar. So when you tell me that the rapture of the church has to take place on Israel's calendar cycle, you are misunderstanding or people are misunderstanding the nature of the church, which has no calendar. So what I'm getting at is is this idea that the rapture is going to happen on trumpets. It's, number one, to misunderstand eminency. Number two, you just put the church under the law of Moses. And number three, you just put the church under a calendar system when the church, by very definition, has no calendar. You follow what's going on here? So when you're saying, making this statement, and people make it very glibly, oh yeah, the rapture's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, they don't understand these other fundamental mistakes that they're making in this area of theology or ecclesiology. Now, let me make you aware of a, a gentleman by John Nelson Darby, who is credited for retrieving from the pages of Scripture the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture, which is what we teach here. He was a Plymouth Brethren, and he was baptizing hundreds of people weekly in his parish. And the government of that time started to get under his skin because they told him, well, you got to make these uh, new converts loyal to our nation. And Darby didn't like that. And Darby uh, got injured in a horse riding accident. I think the date of this would be around the 1830s, give or take. And in that time period, if you got injured and broke your leg riding a horse, um, you didn't really have much else to do. You don't have cable. So, so Darby, what does Darby, what do you think he started to do during this time period as the government of the day is putting him under pressure to make his converts loyal to a nation? He's studying his Bible. And as he's studying his Bible with this broken leg in his time of uh, convalescence, probably thinking that he had done something to disqualify himself from ministry because he was taken out of his parish, which was, by human standards, bearing incredible fruit. He probably thought he had missed God's will. But the truth of the matter is Darby, during that time of study and during the unique circumstances that I'm trying to describe that he was placed under did something for the church which 
far exceeded all of the conversions that were happening in his parish because he gave to some, a doctrine to the church which is transgenerational. And one of the things he started to observe is what I'm talking about here. Gosh, why is it that Israel has a clock with 490 years on it? Why is it that Israel goes into captivity for 70 years? Why is it that she had to go into Egypt for exactly 400 years? Why do I keep saying Latin, all of these odd, quo, quo, odd quim statements for Israel, but I don't see anything like that for the church? Aha! Israel and the church must be separate. And if Israel and the church are separate, then God must be coming back a different time for the church than he is for Israel. Pre-tribulational rapture. So Darby is most known for his retrieving from the, the dustbin of history the doctrine of the pre-tribulational pre rapture, but it was actually Darby's ecclesiology. His first seeing, because he had time to study because of his injury, and he was agitated already because the government was trying to put his converts under a national authority situation. See, the Holy Spirit just worked this whole thing out that he was able to d delineate and identify that Israel and the church are separate. And if Israel and the church are separate, then um, Jesus is coming back at a different time for the church than he is Israel. He's coming back for Israel, excuse me, the church in the rapture, but he's coming back for Israel on the Feast of Trumpets, which is different on Israel's calendar. You with me on this? So, a word of encouragement to you, you might find yourself in a situation where you've been sidelined by God. And you're taken out of what you thought was a prosperous place. Um, had God not done that for Darby, and Darby had continued on winning convert after convert after convert, it's unlikely, in my humble opinion, that we would have the theological understanding that we have today concerning separate programs for Israel and the church, meaning that Jesus is coming back for the church at a different time than Israel. And had God not agitated Darby by putting him under the boot of governing authorities, he wouldn't have been in the right frame of mind to make this discovery, and you couple that with his injury, irritation and injury, I mean, we hate those two things, right? But those are the very things that God used in his life to, to bless us, to, to bless not just a nation, but to bless the church transgenerationally through a doctrinal retrieval. So if God is irritating you and sidelining you, you might take that as the leading of the Holy Spirit because maybe God has something bigger for you than what you're doing. Amen? So this, this area of historical theology, you know, is very fascinating. And those that put the church under the Feast of Trumpets for the rapture do not understand that ecclesiology. Everything I've said, they probably have never been taught in any church environment concerning ecclesiology, that the church has no timing texts, it has no calendar, it has no dates by God's design because the church is a new man. And then when people flippantly say, oh, the rapture's got to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, you've just violated everything that we've talked about. It's, it's a... It's a the eminency issue is just one of several issues, but the far bigger issue is putting the church under the Mosaic law, which God never intended. And number two, it's misunderstanding what the church is. The church is not a nation, so it has no borders, country, military, that's why when we fight spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6 tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not out killing 
the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Girgashites and the Electric Lights and the Termites. And we're not outdoing all that. Israel was because she was a country, but the church is different. You guys with me so far? All right. And look at this. I talked so long. The most important part, I might have to punt, kick the can down the road. So if all of this is true, why did the church begin on the day of Pentecost? I mean, if the rapture of the church could happen totally independent of Israel's calendar, why did God start the church on the day of Pentecost? And we believe as traditional dispensationalists, and in our ecclesiology study, which is available on our archives, I gave you six reasons why we believe that the church started on the day of Pentecost. That's when the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit started, a new man or a new body started, and God began this great work of taking people who have trusted for personal salvation in the Messiah national Israel rejected, God took such people and he baptized them or connected them to Christ's body. That started on the day of Pentecost. That's when there was a dispensational shift. God does not leave the earth without a witness of himself. His hand was on Israel all the way from Old Testament times, but then Israel nationally rejected their own Messiah. And so God can't use national Israel in that state. So he took his hand and he put it on a new man called the church, which consists of a remnant of believers. Started off all Jewish, but as Paul went on his missionary journeys, Gentiles became more and more predominant. That Beginning of the age of the church starts in Acts 2. And Acts 2, as you know, is on a feast day. It's on the day of Pentecost. So let me sort of explain why then the church started on Acts 2. The church started in Acts 2 has nothing to do with the church. But it has to do with a message that God was communicating to Israel. So here are the uh, seven feast days, Leviticus 23, four in the fall, three in the spring. When Jesus was here on the earth, he fulfilled the fall feasts. Let's see, I had that wrong. He fulfilled the spring feasts. There we go. And then the three fall feasts he will fulfill in his second coming, events surrounding his second coming relative to the nation of Israel. And every time Jesus fulfilled a spring feast, the nation of Israel rejected the fulfillment. Now, in the events surrounding his second advent concerning Israel, when he fulfills three fall feasts, trumpets, atonements, and booths, the next time around they will embrace it. But the fall, excuse me, the spring feasts were fulfilled on Christ's first coming, different facets of his first coming, and every fulfillment was rejected by the nation of Israel. So the first fall, excuse me, I keep getting these backwards. The first spring feast, first coming, is Passover, and we know about Passover, don't we? John the Baptist, in John chapter 1, verse 29, publicly said, and keep in mind who John the Baptist was, he was the greatest prophet, according to Christ, of the Old Testament dispensation. John the Baptist said, Behold, he pointed at Jesus, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. And the nation of Israel rejected that because John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He, that's Jesus, came to his own. Who would his own be? The nation of Israel. And his own did not receive him. Then you have the second 
uh, uh, spring feast, and it has to do with unleavened bread. And Jesus fulfilled that feast because he said in John 6 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. Fulfillment of spring feast number two, the feast of unleavened bread, and Israel rejected it. Their rejection is in John 6 verse 41, where it says, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. Because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. So they rejected his fulfillment of Passover. They rejected his fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then there was a third feast called First Fruits. Jesus fulfilled First Fruits with his bodily, what? Resurrection from the dead. That's why Paul himself, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 calls the resurrection of Jesus first fruits. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, the nation, I'm talking about its leaders, rejected that because they paid, Matthew 28, verses 11 through 15, the, the guard's money to, to just make up a story. Oh, the body was stolen. And when the Jewish leaders tried to bribe off the centurions, etc., to dismiss the resurrection of Christ. That is the third spring feast that the nation of Israel rejected. And then Joel predicted that the time in history would come when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. You can't have the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit. And suddenly the Spirit falls on a remnant in Acts chapter 2. And what did the Jewish leaders say about that falling of the Holy Spirit? They said in Acts 2, verse 13, they are drunk. So that's rejection number four. Uh, In fact, the apostles at that point were speaking in tongues, which means languages, a language that they had never learned, but it was understood, a known language. And 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22 says, tongues is a sign not for the believer, but for the what? Unbeliever. That's why the church started on the day of Pentecost, not to put the church under a calendar, but to communicate something to Israel that they had at their fingertips everything they needed for the kingdom to come. They had the Passover lamb. They had unleavened bread. They had the resurrection. The presence of the Holy Spirit was there. And 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 true to form, it's rejection, 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 rejection. That's why Acts 3 comes after Acts 2. You guys with me on that? Where Peter lays out the condition that has to be met For Israel, nationally I'm speaking of, ever to be right with God. He says when the the ministry of the Spirit was rejected by the nation and what was happening with the apostles was attributed to sweet wine and drunkenness, Peter lays out the condition that has to be met before Israel will be right with God and the kingdom will come. He said, therefore, repent, meaning change your mind, And return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's the kingdom. And he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. Well, where is he now? He ascended in Acts 1, didn't he? Whom heaven must receive. In other words, he is in heaven. He's not reigning as king now. He is in heaven functioning with a new man called the church. And that won't happen, or that won't change, I should say, until Israel accepts their Messiah, whom heaven must receive until, so here's the condition, the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So you've got 
Passover, rejected Christ on Passover. Unleavened bread, you rejected him on unleavened bread. First fruits, you rejected that. Pentecost, you reject that. And now God is taking Israel and he's saying, I'm not going to work through you right now. I'm going to work through a new man called the church. And things won't change for Israel until you change your heart towards me. And you stop rejecting everything I do and you accept me. So we are under a calendar where there is now a large gap of time between the fall feasts, the four, excuse me, the four spring feasts and the remaining three fall feasts. Now, what do you think is happening in that long period of time? If Christ never leaves the earth without a witness of himself, that's his work through the church. The church is happening at the conclusion of the spring feasts, but before the fall feast rolls around. So the day in history will come when the church is going to be removed from the earth and God will put Israel through the seven-year tribulation period. And during the seven-year tribulation period and the millennial kingdom that follows, there will be a change of attitude of Israel towards Jesus on those fall feasts. In other words, what they rejected in the spring feast, they will receive when the fall feasts roll around in the second coming. What they rejected in the first advent, they will receive in the second advent. So on trumpets will be the fulfillment of Matthew 24, verse 31, not the rapture. Where Jesus will gather his elect, or Israel, from the four corners of the earth. On the day of atonement, will happen Zechariah 12, verse 10. For they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And then when the millennial kingdom comes around, Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 18, tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Feast of Booths. So do you see a little bit where we're at with all of these things? I mean, we're, we're literally stuck between the initial spring feasts, four of them, and the remaining fall feasts. And it relates to Israel's heart. Israel's heart was hardened in the first advent. They rejected every provision of the fall, uh, the uh, spring feasts, but it will be open in the second advent when they will receive Christ relative to the remaining three fall feasts. And right in the middle is us. So when God started the church on the day of Pentecost, it really has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with a message he was sending to Israel that you have everything you need, including the spirit that's come for the kingdom to start, but you turn me down. So when God started the church on the day of Pentecost, here's sort of the bottom line to the whole thing. He wasn't putting the church under a calendar. He was communicating something to Israel and he was exposing their unbelief. Now that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? And that last point I had to rush through just for the sake of time. So the next time I'm with you, if the rapture doesn't happen first, I'll try to go back into this fourth point. Um, why did the church begin on the day of Pentecost? To hopefully add a little more clarity to what I've said. Um, <clears throat> has any of this I've said today at all understandable? Just put your hand up if some of it... Okay, that makes me feel a lot better. Because it's lonely up here. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your truth, your word. Help us to understand uh, the calendar system. The church is not on a calendar. And help us to really understand proper eschatology in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, happy, happy mini, mini intermission.